Hey there, folks. Ready for another wild ride on our channel? Today, we're diving into Corland, a place where things aren't always as peachy as they seem. Picture this, a town where tough times mingle with some solid community spirit. Corland might be small, but it's got its fair share of troubles. Think gang clashes and shady dealings with stuff that should definitely stay off the streets. Now, let's rewind to a chilly December night back in 2014. It's 8.09 p.m., and boom, emergency services get a call about a car barbecue happening out in the boonies. Firefighters rush in, and what do they find? A car engulfed in flames, smoke painting the sky dark. But here's where it gets real eerie. As they battle the blaze, these heroes spot something creeping out of the bushes nearby. It's like a shadow, barely visible through the smoke. And get this, it's a person, but barely hanging onto life. Skin scorched, looking like something straight out of a horror flick. Creepy, right? As the figure approached, the firefighter saw it was a young woman dressed only in her underwear, covered in burns from head to toe. She approached them and asked for help. The unfortunate woman was completely burned. Her clothes had been incinerated, her skin was melting and slowly dripping downwards, and her entire body was bleeding. Her hair had turned into a charred lump of ash. Her face was black with soot. A rescuer wrapped her blistered body in a blanket and laid her on the ground. As they waited for the emergency medical services crew, the firefighters did not leave her side. The young woman, barely moving her lips, tried to utter individual words, which were indiscernible to those around. Considering her condition, she could not speak clearly but several emergency responders still managed to hear the names Eric or Derek when she was asked who had attacked her. She was airlifted from the small rural town to a hospital in Memphis. However, after sustaining about 93% burns to her body, the young woman passed away four hours later. The victim was 19-year-old local resident Jessica Lane Chambers. Jessica grew up in Corland, living with her mother across the street from her grandmother, while her father and stepmother lived further down the street. She was a petite and fragile young woman, but possessed a steely character. She was raised in a tumultuous family environment, much like many of her friends, relatives, and neighbors. Her father had pleaded guilty to manufacturing methamphetamine and had been arrested for driving under the influence in the early 2000s. In 2006, her 28-year-old neighbor was shot several times in his yard. Growing up in such a negative environment, Jessica did not turn out to be the quiet choir girl. She smoked, quarreled with her parents, had unstable relationships with boyfriends who had legal troubles, and, as her family knew, sometimes acted out violently during disputes. Jessica's behavior became more pronounced at 17, following the death of her older brother Alan in a car accident. In 2012, she moved out of her mother's home for several months after her mother disapproved of Jessica's new boyfriend. Her childhood was challenging. Her father spent some time in prison, but by 2014, he had been released and was working as a mechanic at the local sheriff's department. Jessica was not afraid to break the law occasionally. She sold illegal substances and was affiliated with local gangs. Nevertheless, the sweet and smiling Jessica was respected and liked by almost everyone she knew, making the shocking manner of her demise all the more mysterious. Rumors of a burning car and a deliberate fire-setting incident quickly spread throughout her small hometown. Jessica's father's position in the sheriff's department allowed him to be swiftly informed about the nearby car fire and the incident involving his daughter. Upon hearing the news, his wife ran down the street to tell Jessica's mother about the tragic event. They reached the hospital while Jessica was still alive. The tragic death of the young woman captured the nation's attention. Hundreds attended Jessica's funeral on December 13th, which was a memorial organized in honor of a joyful teenager, a former student cheerleader, and a girl who dreamed of rising above her circumstances. A prolonged investigation into this high-profile case soon followed, stirring public interest. The FBI, ATF, and U.S. Marshals were called in to assist with the local investigation. The initial theory was that the fire resulted from a car accident. However, 
This was quickly ruled out as no signs of emergency braking or any other obstacles were found at the scene. An examination of the burned vehicle also showed no signs of impact or damage to the body. Thus, the theory was not supported. The primary theory then became arson, but at the time of the incident, the police had very few leads, and the lack of evidence prolonged the investigative process. Investigators questioned nearly everyone who might have been in contact with Jessica in the last days of her life. They even explored the possibility that her boyfriend, who was in prison at the time of the arson, might have ordered her demise. However, this theory was dismissed, as he had been living in Iowa since their breakup. Ali Alai, the owner of a gas station, also came under suspicion. He was one of the last people to see Jessica alive. Ali gave his statement and was released. There was a theory that Jessica had brought trouble upon herself by associating with one of the local gangs. However, the gang members denied their involvement and expressed their condolences to the Chambers family. Many of those called in for questioning had good reasons to lie. Even if they didn't know who ended her life, it seemed the investigation was at a standstill. There was neither a suspect nor a motive for such a brutal act. The public pressure on the investigation demanded justice, thereby slowing down the investigative process and repeatedly providing false leads. About Jessica's life, here are some of the theories that were most popular on social media. For instance, locals accused Brian Rudd, Jessica's ex-boyfriend from high school, who might have acted out of jealousy in a moment of intense emotion. Others suggested that Jessica sold someone faulty pills for several hundred, which could have angered a dealer. This is the most mysterious case I have ever worked on, said District Attorney John Champion, who has been serving in the county for 22 years. He has been working on Jessica's case since December, together with local detectives, the MBI, FBI, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, and the U.S. Marshals Service. According to Champion, they have interviewed and in some cases re-interviewed over 130 people, including several individuals named Eric and Derek. Yet, authorities have not arrested any suspects so far. After some time, investigators managed to reconstruct the last week of Jessica's life, minute by minute, up to her tragic end on December 5th, 2014. After receiving a call on her cell phone, Jessica drove to the mini-mart following a call from a friend. She purchased $1.14 worth of gasoline and left in her car. At 5.15 p.m., around 5.45 p.m., she called her mother to say she would return in a little. While her hair was pulled back in a bun and she was dressed in camouflage pajama pants, she then made a few more stops, one at an unknown house and another in the nearest town, before arriving at the scene of her tragic end. Possibly already accompanied in her car by the person who would end her life, surveillance cameras also captured a man in a striped shirt refueling a gas can before heading in the same direction as Jessica. However, there were no confirming data about the man's further movements. Cell phone records indicated that she spent about 10 to 15 minutes near a traffic light on Highway No. 62, heading towards Batesville. The subsequent 62 minutes, between 6.30 p.m. and 7.32 p.m., also known as the mystery hour, took time to unravel. At 7.30 p.m., Jessica's phone showed that she reached the location on Heron Road, where her burning car was later found. So where did Jessica Chambers go, and what led to her brutal fate? The investigation moved very slowly. Only in December 2015, in a separate case involving charges of illegal possession of weapons, controlled substances and counterfeits, 17 suspected gang members were arrested. District Attorney John Champion did not expect any of the gang members to be directly linked to the case of the burning incident. It turned out that during plea negotiations, all gang members were offered the opportunity to assist the investigation. Thus, the gang members pointed to a certain Quentin Tellus. Then, investigators finally learned who Jessica was within an hour before the fire. But in February 2016, authorities announced a pause in the case to conduct a more detailed investigation and establish a motive. 
The lack of official suspects only deepened the spread of baseless rumors, which circulated on the internet and then throughout the town. This situation attracted online detectives. A Facebook page called Justice for Jessica was created, offering a $50,000 reward for information, leading to the arrest and a widespread search for her assailant. Rumors also circulated online that Jessica, who had previously dated African-American men, had been targeted by white supremacists for her involvement in interracial relationships. Conversely, online conspiracy theorists suggested that the culprits were African-American because Jessica was in a gang and the crime was perpetrated in retaliation for trying to leave it. However, none of these theories received official confirmation. The investigation became particularly interested in the figure of Quentin Tellis. After revisiting social media and Jessica's cell phone, they identified whom the young cheerleader had been communicating with in the last hours of her life. During the first interrogation, 29-year-old Quentin Tellis recounted that the meeting, which had been arranged by text message, was the only time they met, and he did not know her well, merely asking for a ride home. However, with more comprehensive information and presenting all the messages, Tellis was arrested on charges of ending Jessica Chambers' life through arson. Text messages revealed that Tellis repeatedly sent Jessica requests of a very intimate nature. On the day of the tragedy, Jessica texted Quinton at 9.02 a.m. to tell him she had just woken up, and he replied a few minutes later that he had as well. At 10.09 a.m., Tellis texted Chambers, I'm ready. Shortly after she stopped at the M&M gas station, she was captured on surveillance footage leaving the M&M a few minutes later, presumably to pick up Tellus. Afterwards, they picked up one of Jessica's friends around 10.49 a.m. Jessica dropped Quinton off later around 2.03 p.m. Tellus began messaging Jessica again, this time explicitly asking for some love. This was the fourth message in four days in which he requested intimacy via text. Other deleted texts were recovered, including messages like, I'm excited, and come lie with me, which Jessica left unanswered. The passenger seat in Jessica Chambers' burned car was pushed back, a position typical for intimate activities in a car. Prosecutors argued that this was evidence that the two were engaged in, or at least attempting, intimacy that tragic evening on February 24th. Tellus was charged with Jessica's life and arson. It took the investigation considerable time to build the case. The first trial in the Jessica Chambers case began in 2017 in Batesville, Mississippi, about 50 miles south of Memphis. The trial was highly publicized, with strict security measures in place. Jurors were sequestered, and spectators were screened with metal detectors before entering the courtroom. Prosecutor John Champion warned the jurors that they would see disturbing images of the burned Jessica Chambers and hear testimony from about 35 witnesses. Investigators stated that Jessica met Quinton Tellis around Thanksgiving in November 2014. He was seven years her senior and had attended the same high school before she enrolled there in October of that same year. He had been released from prison, where he had served time for burglary. FBI agent Dustin Blount testified during the first trial that he met Jessica through a friend at a gas station in Cortland, Mississippi. They spent a lot of time driving around together. On multiple occasions, he went as far as to say that they had been intimate. He stated that they had been in the passenger seat, detailing further that the passenger seat was reclined back and he was sitting in the passenger seat with Jessica Chambers sitting on him. In court, John Champion said there was a series of text messages between them, even on the day of her demise, in which he requested intimacy. The front seat in the burned car was adjusted downward, as Tellis had described during their previous encounter. Champion claimed that Tellis attempted to end her life by strangulation, then, thinking she was deceased, doused her with gasoline and set her alight. A friend of Jessica who testified indicated that the three of them had ridden in Jessica's car the day before the incident. Later, Tellis confessed to investigators that he saw Jessica that night, and they went to a fast food restaurant together. Various friends he claimed to have been with when the fire started could not confirm his alibi. He then appeared on a store surveillance camera several miles away, 
where he was purchasing a phone card for a friend who lived in Louisiana. Tellis did not testify in his own defense at the trial. A central element of the defense was the fact that several emergency responders at the scene of the tragedy reported hearing Jessica utter the name Eric or Derek. Ultimately, two jurors reacted to the fact that Quinton Tellis's name sounded nothing like Eric or Derek. Panola County District Attorney John Champion pointed to text messages in which Tellis repeatedly requested intimacy from Chambers. You will see text messages between them where Quinton is consistently asking Jessica for intimacy, and she is consistently denying him. Champion testified at the first trial. It was proven that there was a series of text messages even on the day of her death where he was requesting intimacy from her. Also, FBI agent Dustin Blount shared that during questioning, Tellis admitted to deleting Jessica's contact information and all their text messages from his phone soon after her demise. When asked why, Quinton calmly responded, I wasn't scared, but once we found out who it was who had passed there, I mean, I just deleted my contact with her because I didn't want to have a deceased person in my phone, a number in my phone that just wouldn't be used anymore. At the first trial, FBI agent Dustin Blount demonstrated that Tellis and Chambers met through a friend at a gas station in their small hometown of Cortland. They drove around together a lot many times, said Agent Blount, who recalled interrogating Tellis. He went so far as to say that they had been intimate at some point. Agent Blount, who spoke with Tellis at his home 11 days after Jessica's passing, asked Tellis to describe the intimate encounter and pinpoint where it occurred. Tellis indicated a driveway south of the house he shared with his mother back in December 2014. He lived with his mother in a trailer up the road from the convenience store, where Jessica Chambers was last seen before the fire. His DNA was found on the woman's keys, and his cell phone records placed him at that location on the night in question. However, Quentin Tellis continued to maintain his innocence. Defense attorney Darla Palmer, in her opening statement, urged the jurors to disregard the cell phone location evidence, which she argued could not prove that Tellis and Chambers were at the same place. Clinton has always maintained his innocence, telling police in the interrogation room, even after being threatened with capital punishment if it went to trial. I've told the truth. I did not end Jessica's life. I don't have it in my heart to end anyone's life. His family claims that the police are merely looking for someone to blame in a case that has become a highly charged racial issue since Tellis, who is African-American, was arrested for the death of the attractive white cheerleader. Investigators looked for connections to other recent fires in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. Jessica was a white woman who dated African-American men, and she wasn't the first white woman attacked over interracial relationships but they say they found no links. I can't tell you how many different theories we've considered, said Champion. Typically, law enforcement can quickly identify suspects in a homicide through street informants, interviewing witnesses. But no matter how much we've cooperated with people, listening to testimony, taking DNA swabs, conducting polygraph tests, we haven't come any closer to an arrest. The first trial in 2017 ended in a mistrial due to confusion related to the jury instructions. They stated that a guilty verdict must be unanimous, but did not explicitly say the same for a not guilty verdict. Officials noted that the jurors apparently decided that since they could not unanimously agree on Tellus' guilt, this implied his innocence. By the time of the retrial in 2018, Quentin Tellus was under investigation in Louisiana for the end of life of student Ming Chen Xia, as well as for the illegal use of a stolen bank card. In May 2019, he was charged with second-degree murder in connection with Xia's demise. The second trial was notably challenging. Jurors were shown a photo of Jessica Chambers, which firefighter Cole had taken upon arriving at the scene. Cole shared that the image of Chambers, her lips blackened with soot, haunted her, and she told jurors, I see this photo I took every morning and every night. A veteran firefighter stated that he had never seen a victim with such severe burns. When he found the young woman lying on the ground, barely able to speak after she had been deliberately set on fire, she was sitting on a blanket. Her hair was singed, stood around her nose and mouth, blisters all over her body. 
Cole, the Panola County Director of Emergency Operations, told the jurors, I sat and held her hand. That's all I could do, said firefighter Cole Haley, holding back tears. I told her sweetheart it's going to be okay, and she replied, I am going to die. At that moment I lay down beside her, Haley recounted. Her skin was hanging from her lips and her nose, testified paramedic Bradley Dixon. Her eyelashes and eyebrows were gone. The hair on her head was a warm matted clump. Testimonies at the second hearing also included a woman named Sherry Flowers, who had not appeared at the first trial of TELUS, but told investigators during questioning that she had picked media critics, used the term missing white woman syndrome to describe the national obsession with victims who are young, blonde, and white. And Jessica fit all these criteria, a former cheerleader with flaxen hair weighing just 90 pounds. But those obsessed with Jessica's death are particularly fixated on her tiny hometown. Outsiders can easily track down social media accounts and even phone numbers of Jessica's family members, friends, ex-boyfriends, and sworn enemies, all of whom have reported being contacted by strangers wanting to interrogate them about whether they took the life of the teenager. The police say they still don't know who ended her life and why, leaving the mystery in the hands of online amateur sleuths who may do more harm than good. When does a personal tragedy become a public spectacle? The Justice for Jessica memorial page on Facebook, managed by Jessica's older stepsister, remains popular. It has united many compassionate people from around the world who once heard about the young woman burned alive. People send letters of sympathy, supportive words for the family and friends, and donate books and gifts in Jessica's name. Hanging in Jessica's room is a memorial quilt made of bright pink patches with zebra prints, along with her photo and the dates of her birth and death. The words secret group were stitched into the top left square. No one knows what this phrase means, as the quilt, like other gifts, came from around the world. Tragically, Jessica's death did not change the town of Cortland. Everyone knows each other here, and both authorities and locals believe the attack was personal. 29-year-old Quentin Tellis, serving time for a different crime, is not a free man yet. Justice for Jessica still has not been achieved. Regrettably, Jessica's mother Lisa passed away on October 29, 2021, at the age of 52, without seeing justice served for her daughter. It remains uncertain whether there will be a third trial for the case of the young woman burned alive. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel. There are many shocking stories ahead of you.